Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and welcome to episode one of my series, The JFK Assassination, 60 Years Later. This is the 60th anniversary year of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. November 22nd of this year will be the 60th anniversary of that assassination. So I've decided to have this series to focus in on this assassination and to bring an increased awareness to how it happened and why it happened. And the most important part is the why it happened. Uh, because I have firmly believed for many years that this assassination and the circumstances surrounding the assassination in the context of the Cold War provide us with the way to extricate ourselves from the morass in which we find ourselves, especially with respect to foreign policy. As you all know, we're right now enmeshed in a very dangerous game in Ukraine, where the Pentagon used NATO to begin absorbing Eastern Bloc countries, moving all the way up to Ukraine, knowing full well what the response was going to be, and nonetheless went ahead and threatened to absorb Ukraine, knowing that what the response would be on, on the part of Russia, which of course was the invasion. And now, with so many troops having been killed on both sides, but it's estimated that hundreds of thousands of, of Russian soldiers have lost their lives, there's just no telling what, where this thing can lead. And uh, even in just a small accident or a, a misstep can result in all-out nuclear war between the United States and Russia. And there seems to be somewhat of a fatalistic response among the American people to this. There's a, there's a certain passivity. It's almost as if, well, what's the point? There's nothing we can do about it. And if this is what happens, it happens. Um, well, there's always something that can be done about it. And, and the, the way out of this morass can come about by studying the circumstances surrounding this assassination. Uh, that's, how it, how, that's how big and how important and momentous this occurrence was. Uh, as you all know, we just just recently got out of a 20-year deadly and destructive war in Afghanistan where countless people were killed. I would estimate that, gosh, 99% of the people that U.S. forces killed in Afghanistan had nothing to do with the 9-11 attacks. And then, of course, there was the war of aggression against Iraq, who, which clearly had nothing to do with the 9-11 attacks, and countless people were killed there as well. Uh, you know, Martin Luther King made an interesting comment when he was alive. Today, of course, King is honored and celebrated and commemorated. There's statues to him. There's streets named after him. Uh, there's a national holiday, federal holiday. But we should keep in mind what King said. And I think that amidst all the celebrating of King's life, we pretty much give short shrift to this sentence. He said that the U.S. government is the, was, at that time, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. Now, this was in the midst of the Vietnam War, where the United States had invaded Vietnam and was killing countless people there, too. Uh, they sacrificed some 58,000 men of my generation, including some of my schoolmates at Virginia Military Institute, and they sacrificed them for nothing. They were just absolutely nothing, but it was all part of this Cold War environment, stopping the communists. And here's King saying that the U.S. government is the greatest purveyor of violence. That's a remarkable statement. And I don't know of very many people that have really focused in on that, that the fact that we're, we're celebrating a man's life with a national holiday, streets, and so forth, who said that our government, the U.S. government, was the greatest purveyor of violence. And that includes the Soviet Union, uh, Red China, North Korea, Cuba, the, every communist country. King is saying the U.S. government is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. That's a remarkable statement. I, I think that we should, as a nation, be reflecting on that and, and asking ourselves, was King right? Uh, was, he, was he telling the truth? Was this, was this a genuine fact that he was, he was stating? You know, those of you who are familiar with my work uh, know that for a long time I've been recommending a book called National Security and Double Government by Michael J. Glennon. 
It's a profound book. It's a scholarly book, but very readable. I, I wish every single American would read Glennon's book. Now, Glennon's not your standard crackpot. I mean, this guy is a professor of law at Tufts University. Uh, he served as counsel to the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee. We've, we've had him speak at one of our conferences. You can see his talk online at our website at fff.org. This guy is stout in terms of credentials. You can see, find him on Wikipedia, and you will be impressed, I guarantee it. Uh, the thesis of his book is a very deep and a very profound one. He argues that the real force of the government is the national security segment of the government. That is the Pentagon, the CIA, and the NSA. That he is saying that it is this segment of the government, or branch of the government, if you will, that is really in charge of the federal government, and especially with respect to foreign policy. If what he's saying is true, that means then that it's the Pentagon and the CIA who are running the show in Ukraine. And this is a situation in Ukraine, as everyone knows, that has brought us precariously close to nuclear war, uh, just like what happened in 1962. But what a lot of Americans don't realize is that it was the, it was the Pentagon and the CIA that were really in the, at the root responsible for bringing the world, specifically the United States and the Soviet Union, to the very edge of nuclear war at that time. Um, we're all taught in our public schools and the main, reinforced by the mainstream press that, that it was the Soviet Union, the communists, that ginned up this crisis in Cuba. But as we'll see in this series, nothing could be further from the truth. It was the Pentagon and the CIA that were the root cause of this crisis that brought us so close to nuclear war, which really would have destroyed all life on Earth. Well, so if you combine these two things, Martin Luther King's statement that the U.S. government is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world with Glennon's thesis that it is the national security branch of the government that is in charge of the government, and the, you've got the other three branches just deferring to the real power. Uh, that is a very ominous thing to be living under here in the United States. It's, uh, it's, it's not the kind of society that we're all taught about in our civics classes in high school. You know, where we're all taught, oh, there's three branches of government, legislative, executive, and judicial, and they counterbalance each other and so forth. That what we're talking about is living under a military nation, a military nation that is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. And you'll see, in, possibly in the very next episode of this series, maybe the third episode, uh, that that was the very case on November 22nd, 1963. You'll see it very clearly. Now, it wasn't clear at the time. It was sort of just considered normal. But as we look back on it, we can see that it was a military nation that back then, too. The military was in charge, the military intelligence establishment. Now, let me address something else. That I fully recognize that there's lots of people that do not want to discuss this, this subject. It, it's just, you know, conspiracy theory, Jacob, conspiracy theory. And that's just standard response. Conspiracy theory, whenever you bring up the Kennedy assassination. And I... I over the years, I've tried to figure out what is going on with that because it's... A lot of these same people, they'll steep themselves into murders like, you know, the, the O.J. Simpson case or some other case. And they'll tell you, hey, have you seen this? And this was going on. And it's on the TV and so forth. But all of a sudden, when it comes to the Kennedy assassination, it's just conspiracy theory. And they, they close their ears. and They don't want to hear. Uh, and now it's one thing to review all the evidence and and conclude, well, no, I'm just not convinced of this. But it's quite another thing when a person says, I just don't want to even hear about it. I don't want to know about it. Rabbit holes, Jacob, rabbit holes. That's another one I hear, I've heard over the years. And I've concluded that, that, that the real reason for this is fear, just deep fear. Uh, imagine 
Let's just imagine for a second that this was, on November 22nd, 1963, a regime change operation on the part of the national security establishment, similar to other regime change operations they've carried out against foreign leaders. Uh, where does that leave us? I mean, the Pentagon and the CIA they, and the NSA, too, they're a permanent part of American governmental structure. And if, if this is true that this governmental structure engaged in a regime change operation, that can be very frightening to somebody because a lot of people have come to conclude that the Pentagon and the CIA are like gods, that they're the ones keeping us safe. They keep us safe from the terrorists and the communists and the Russians and the Chinese and the Syrians and the Venezuelans and the Cubans and the North Koreans. And all of a sudden to contemplate that this structure here has elements of evil to it, an evil that that was reflected, demonstrated on November 22nd, 1963, that is a very, very frightening prospect for someone that feels that they have to have this structure in order to be kept safe. And so I think that's why they'd rather not even touch it. In fact, I, I think that was most likely going on in 1963 among a lot of federal officials. They they knew deep down that something was wrong here, but they didn't dare confront what it might be for fear that if it were proven that this was a regime change operation, where would that leave Americans? Because it, it, the, the popular conception was that we're in a cold war against the communists. The communists are coming to take over. And the only thing standing between us and the Reds are the Pentagon, the CIA, and the NSA, the national security state. And if all of a sudden the national security state turned inward, turned its guns inwards uh, to protect national security by removing a president who they were convinced was a threat to national security, where would that leave people? I mean, what do they do at that point? You know, do, do they dismantle the, 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 this, this evil force and then subject themselves to a communist takeover in their minds because they felt that this was the, the barrier that was keeping them from t being taken over. And I saw, so I think that's what's going on here is that there's just a fear of, of not wanting to confront this particular uh, occurrence. Uh, I don't see the same fear with respect to considering other regime change operations like the one in 1953 against uh, the Iranian democratically elected prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, or the very following year, uh, regime change operation against the democratically elected president of Guatemala. Uh, the CIA orchestrated that one. Ten years after the Kennedy assassination, there was the Chilean uh, regime change operation, which bears remarkable similarities to the Kennedy assassination. And in fact, uh, the U.S. national security establishment was in large part responsible for bringing about that particular regime change operation. So there doesn't seem to be any reluctance to learn about those, but when the Kennedy assassination comes up, it's like, oh, conspiracy theory, conspiracy. I, I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear. No, I got too much to do. I got to go. Uh, well, we're going to confront the the discomfort associated with this, this uh, assassination because we have to. Because if it really happened, like some of us believe it happened, it has to be confronted. I mean, it's part of our, our heritage, our, our dark heritage of, as a national security state. Uh, now, what is a national security state? Well, it's a totalitarian form of governmental structure. Uh, it, it's, um, it, it's, it's a type of government in which at least part of the government wields omnipotent totalitarian-like powers, uh, such as the power of assassination. I mean, practically from the time that the U.S. was converted to a national security state, in around 1947, uh, the, when the CIA was called into existence, it had the power of assassination uh, as well as the power of torture. So did the Pentagon. But the assassination power was generally uh, exercised by the CIA. In 1954, they targeted um, the democratically elected president of Guatemala, Gobo Arbenz, with assassination. They, now, they, they didn't pull it off. He was able to escape the country, but and they still won't let us see the assassination list. They say that national security would be jeopardized if we saw the list, but clearly Arbenz had to be at the top of the list. Now, and keep in mind that 
Arbenz had never done anything to the United States. I mean, he had never attacked the United States or anything like that. Um, now, for those people that say, well, the, the CIA and the Pentagon, they would never assassinate a foreign leader. Oh, come on. Um, now, if, if you take, for example, uh, the leader of the Congo, Patrice Lumumba, uh, they had decided to assassinate Lumumba before Kennedy came into, into power. Uh, they, because they considered him a threat to U.S. national security. So you, you might ask, well, how would the leader of the Congo threaten U.S. national security? Well, it's a flexible term, national security. Nobody's ever come up with a real definition of it. So it's it's flexible. It's, it's malleable. And uh, they decide that he was part of an independence movement there that was trying to throw off the shackles of, of foreign rule. And therefore, he that made him a communist, you see, I mean, they thought the same thing about Martin Luther King. They were convinced that King was a communist. So yeah, they celebrate him today. But back then, they were 100% certain, the Pentagon and the CIA, as well as the FBI, that King was a communist and that he was serving as a communist front for when the communists would come and get us. Well, Lumumba, uh, Kennedy admired Lumumba, and he had, he admired these third world uh uh, movements, independence movements. And so the, the CIA, realizing this, decided they better hurry up this assassination before Kennedy gets into power. And they, and they pulled it off. They, they, got, they got him assassinated. And, and you know, there's, a, there's a great picture of Kennedy receiving news of Lumumba's death. He's on the telephone and a photographer captures it. Uh, you can see it online. Um, it's, it's, in fact, it's the cover of a book called Ordeal in Africa. Uh, and you can just see Kennedy's face. There's grimace, pain on his face about learning this. Now, he didn't know that the, that the CIA had orchestrated this assassination. And, it, and it, at that point, it, it would legitimately be called a conspiracy theory if you came and said, you know, I bet you the CIA carried this out. And somebody could say, oh, conspiracy theory. Well, it really would be a theory. Uh, but as time went on and more evidence surfaced, you cross the line from conspiracy theory to a suspicion, and then you become convinced, and then you become convinced beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the, the standard of proof in a, in a criminal case. And at that point, you realize, okay, they really did do this. Well, that's really what's happened in the Kennedy assassination, okay? In the early days, it starts out as a, as a theory, but even in the earliest times, there were hardly there was hardly anyone who suspected that the national security establishment had done this that that was just inconceivable uh, and so if you look at the early assassination books um, they they mostly focus around the incompetence of the government that how could the government be so incompetent to overlook this and overlook that and they need to reopen the investigation because they they just didn't do this right they should never have close the investigation so soon. And it's all pointing out things that they should have done, but they failed to do sort of out of negligence. That they, they, just, they just blew this investigation. That, that was the mindset. Because at this point, 63, everybody had this overarching faith in the government. It, it never occurred to most people, I'd say 98.9% .9 of the American people, that the government would do something bad internally. And probably externally as well. Remember, the, the the U.S. had not been a national security state for that long. We we started out as a limited government republic. That was our founding governmental system with a relatively small basic military force, uh, no CIA, no NSA, no mass secret surveillance, no assassinations, nothing. That was our system of government, you know, for 150 years or so. And then it it got changed after World War II to a national security state. Uh, with omnipotent powers. And so, you know, if, if, you, if you pose the idea, which hardly anyone did, I don't know if anybody did, right after the assassination that this was a regime change operation. Now, they, they may have been doing this in Europe because they're kind of used to this type of thing. Uh, but here in the United States, inconceivable, just inconceivable. Um, and so if somebody says, if somebody did raise it and they said, that's a conspiracy theory, they'd, they'd be very legitimate in concluding that. But as time went on and people started questioning things and, and started looking at it critically, there was just too many anomalies here. 
And so you cross over from conspiracy theory to suspicion, and then you get to a point with more evidence and, and you become convinced. And then finally you get to a point where you're, you know it beyond a reasonable doubt that this is what happened. Same thing like with Lumumba or with what happened in Chile or Iran or uh, Guatemala. There's just more resistance to this kind of thing when it happens domestically. And, and like I said, I think it's part of the fear. Now, let me share with you in this episode how I came to become interested in the Kennedy assassination. Um, I was, um, I grew up in a, a town called Laredo, Texas. My dad was very active in Democratic Party politics. Uh, he, uh, I was campaigning for Kennedy and Johnson in the 1960 race. My dad would take me down to campaign headquarters. I was just a kid, but my dad, I think I was in the fifth grade, but my dad would take me down to campaign headquarters at, every night on school nights to stuff envelopes. And it was exciting. I mean, uh, and, and Laredo was a political powerhouse in Texas. The, the local Democratic Party, my dad was a Democrat, um, they could control a block vote of some six or 7,000 votes. Uh, they were even mentioned in, in uh, The Making of a President in 1960, that book, um, because it was mostly the school district. <laughs> and uh, they, everybody was convinced in Laredo that the, the public officials, the, the party stronghold, was monitoring how people voted. And that if you voted, you didn't vote Democrat, you'd lose your job in the school district as a teacher, as an administrator. And so I don't know if they were really monitoring votes, but I know this, everybody was convinced they were. And, you know, when I asked my dad, he just would kind of smile, he wouldn't say anything, you know. Uh, well, during that campaign, uh, my dad is invited to go to the Lyndon Johnson Ranch in, in uh, Johnson City, Texas for a barbecue. And so I tag along with the Laredo contingent, and lo and behold, I meet Lyndon Johnson at the LBJ Ranch, shake hands with him. He says, uh, what are you doing for me down there, son? And I said, well, I'm, I'm stuffing envelopes for you, Mr. Johnson. And yeah, well, keep it up. And so they end up winning, which was very exciting because I really liked John Kennedy. And uh, so I'm, I think everybody, you know, of a certain age remembers where they were when they learned about the Kennedy assassination. It was just such a shocking thing that it was just seared into your conscious and subconscious. And I was waiting outside biology class. I think I was in the eighth grade and uh, waiting for class to start. And a classmate comes up and says, President Kennedy's been shot. And it was just such a stunner. And then, of course, uh, learned shortly after that that he had died. Uh, and then, you know, you, you know, I had all the, the, the narrative, the official narrative, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald assassinated the president. And, and that was, uh, that was just a done deal. And then he gets assassinated. And I had no reason to question any of that. I, I know, I know my dad never questioned it. My mom never questioned it. I never heard any questioning of it. In fact, you're going to find this hard to believe, but I went all the way to the time I was about 41 or so. I'd never heard any alternative theory of what had happened. I didn't even know it was controversial. I just assumed this lone nut ex-communist Marine had killed the president. Well, then I hear, I think it was in 1991, of Oliver Stone's movie, JFK. And I'd, I'd started FFF, the Future Freedom Foundation, about a year before. And I decided, but I had not read anything. I was so involved with trying to get my foundation going. Uh, those were tough times for us. And I, I had not read any of the controversy swirling up about the film. So I decided to go to the movies because I figured this is just a biographical sketch of, of, um, of John Kennedy's life and who I deeply admired. And and I'm, I'm now by this time, of course, I, I was a libertarian. I'd already started the Future Freedom Foundation. But uh, I go into this movie thinking I'm going to see this story of his life. And I'm just bowled over. I mean, I'm just stunned. I, I, I just, my jaw was dropping as I was watching this movie. And, and I realized that this is not just some fun, fun fiction, that Stone was deadly serious. And his thesis was, that Kennedy was assassinated by his enemies in the national security establishment, that this was a definite regime change operation. And I was, I was blown away. I mean, I thought, oh my gosh. Um, and the movie was so well done, as y'all know. 
So I went home and, and uh, I started doing some checking and I started finding books on the assassination and I started reading. And I reached a point where I realized that there's a lot of anomalies here, a lot of strange things, which, you know, I never, never had known about before, but which made me suspicious, uh, like the magic bullet theory. You know, the, 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 the idea that the, the bullet had come in in the back of President Kennedy's neck, even though on the autopsy report, and, and according to several doctors in the autopsy, the bullet actually came in, into his back, which would have made it impossible to, to come out the neck. And so they, they sort of moved it up to the, to the neck, and then it comes out the neck, the front of the neck, supposedly, uh, veers over and hits Governor Conley in the ribs, breaks ribs, and then uh, goes through Conley and hits his wrist and breaks wrist bone. I mean, these are these are tough bones, uh, the wrists and the and the ribs, and then lodges itself in his thigh, and then it comes out totally pristine, like a brand new bullet, <laughs> you know, like it had been fired in water or cotton or something. That's impossible. I mean, it's impossible. A bullet's going to mangle when it hits bones. Uh, but this was the pristine magic bullet. And I thought, wow, when I read that, that's kind of strange. And then uh, hiding the rifle. You know, when, when uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, the accused, is supposedly escaping, he takes time to hide the rifle. That's ridiculous. Who would take the time to hide the rifle when you're trying to get out of there? I mean, it, it makes no sense. Your, your job is to get out of there. It's not like, oh, well, maybe they will I'll hide it so well they, they won't find it here behind these boxes. That's ridiculous. Uh, then um, the, the idea that he was a communist, joining the Marines, and the Marines let him stay in as a communist made no sense. And then he goes to the, to the Soviet Union where he promises to let go of all the secrets that he had learned in, while he was a Marine and... Then he comes back and he's given the red carpet treatment. <laughs> there's no torture. There's no indictment. There's no hauling before a grand jury. That This guy had betrayed America. <laughs> he said he wanted to be a Soviet citizen. And he comes back in la-di-da with, with nary a concern. I said, this just doesn't happen. This is not normal. And and then the fact that they shut down the investigation immediately, right? As, as Oswald is... is uh, is shot. They they just shut down the investigation immediately. That that's impossible. Anybody that kills a federal official, they're gonna pull out all the stops to get everybody. And the reason I know this is because uh like the Kiki Camarena case, y'all maybe have heard about that. In 1985, a Mexican drug cartel kidnaps a DEA agent, young guy, early 30s or so. Uh, tortures him brutally, and then executes him. Well, the U.S. government unleashed everything they could uh, to send a message, you will never do this. This is why, you know, DEA agents operate in Latin America all the time, but notice how they're never assassinated. It'd be pretty easy to ambush them and assassinate them. Nobody touches them because they know the messages have been sent out. You don't dare kill a federal agent. Uh, same thing many years ago, they, they uh, an assassin killed a federal judge named John Wood in San Antonio. And man, the feds pulled out all the stop to bring everybody to justice. So when they shut this thing down immediately, I'm sitting there. Uh, well, as I was reading more and more books, I, I was crossing the area of suspicion to finally I became convinced, but not beyond a reasonable doubt. I, I, there were still too many holes. And, and the way I see the JFK assassination, like assassination, it's like a giant jigsaw puzzle uh, where you're, you're putting all the pieces together and you may not have all the pieces, but like with a regular jigsaw puzzle, you may have 75% of the pieces and there'll be holes and gaps, but you can still see that, for example, that it's the Eiffel Tower. Well, that's the way the JFK assassination is. That you, you'll, you'll, we will never have all the jigsaw pieces to the puzzle, but we have, you know, seventy-five percent, eighty percent, where we can see what happened here. Um, but even as I was reading all these books, and many of them were fantastic, the assassination researchers were just heroic people, and how they were able to compile the, this evidence that was slowly coming out, as as we'll examine during the course of the series, uh, they were writing about it. But there was always something wrong that I 
I couldn't really put my hands on it of what was going on. You know, I, I was trained to think as a lawyer. You know, I got a law degree and I practiced law for 12 years. And so what I do whenever I find something mysterious or unexplainable, I compile all the available facts and I put them in my mind and I'll take long walks and sift them and I'll, I'll put them up against a theory. Theory one, theory two. And if something doesn't fit, I discard that theory and I go to theory, theory two and I sift and process and see what works. And if it doesn't, I just keep going. And that's what I was doing. There was just certain things that just I couldn't reconcile. Uh, I couldn't get convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that this is what happened. And then I discovered a five-volume book called Inside the Assassination Records Review Board by a man named Douglas Horn. And as I was reading through volume one, Volume 2, Volume 3, I'm going, hmm, hmm, hmm. Volume 4, Volume 5, Horn had put it all together. It was incredible. Uh, it, it, he put in all the holes. And the thing that distinguishes Horn, he's one of the most remarkable people I've ever met. We've become friends since then. Uh, he has spoken at our conferences. I, I highly recommend watching everything Horn ever has ever said, including his talks at our conferences. I've never met anyone with a more relentless quest for the truth and meticulous attention to detail. It's incredible. Uh, and that's the book that put it all together for me. Five-volume work. It's not an easy read. It's a tough read. Horn has mastered photography, x-rays, medical evidence. He served on the staff of the Assassination Records Review Board, which we'll discuss as this series proceeds. But it was Horn that placed me past theory, past suspicion, past convince, and into the area of being convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that there is an evil force within the structure of this government, one that is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. This is episode one of the JFK assassination 60 years later. I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation.